Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessa, and I'm so happy you're here for this episode of Better Sex. I've dedicated my professional life to helping couples enjoy a fulfilling, intimate life. I believe that sex is important. Our connections to other people matter, and we're not living our life to the fullest if we aren't connecting emotionally and sexually with our partner. That's why I'm here, bringing ideas and information to help you live and love better. Today's episode is another one in my series of personal stories. I am really enjoying talking to people about, you know, the struggles they have faced, how that showed up in their sex life, what they did about it, and especially the happy ending for those that get there. How have they transformed their sex life into something that they can really enjoy and feel good about? And what words of wisdom do they have for us? You know, what can we learn from the struggles that people have? Even if we don't have the same ones, can we keep their words and their perspective in mind if we face struggles in the future? If you've been enjoying the personal stories, you know, just look for that. They're all marked explicitly in the episode list, and you can seek those out and listen to those if you would like. So my guest today, Jen, has sort of a huge assortment of struggles and challenges that she's faced between molestation as a kid, between date rape as a, uh, I think the end of high school, she said, or early college, struggling with infertility, plenty of miscarriages, and then divorce and hysterectomy. (laughs) I mean, there's a whole list. I can't imagine anyone's gone through everything that she has, but she's got a beautiful, uplifting story of openness to her own healing, sort of awareness about what she needed and an ability to recognize those opportunities when they crossed her path and really embracing sex for all its beautiful, emotional and physical, intimate connection with the partners that she's had. So I hope you're going to enjoy her story today and learn something from it. Hey, Jen, thank you so much for being with me today to share your story. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's always such an honor to hear people's personal journeys around sex and relationships. So I appreciate it. Absolutely. So I guess start out with some background. What uh, Tell us you know, about you and the kinds of challenges and things that you have faced. Okay. Um, you know, my first, I don't know if it's a sexual experience, but sexually related experience was I went to my first. OBGYN appointment when I was 15, right before I was 16. And I went because I hadn't started my period. So (laughs) the first experience I had with a man touching me below the belt was in a doctor's office with an OBGYN. It was actually a great experience. I had no issue that he was male. I mean, it's very, it was very uncomfortable just emotionally the first time, not knowing what to expect. It ended up being a very good visit. Because he was very, very soft-spoken, very gracious. Um, He was good about knowing that I was a 16-year-old virgin. Yeah, good, good. Because, but man, I hear other kinds of stories than that sometimes. So yeah, yeah. I I know, me too. And so I'm I'm very thankful for that. That my first medical experience was positive, which helped me down the road further. The interesting thing about this appointment was that he looked at me and he said, "You're probably going to have a hard time getting pregnant." Hmm. expect to possibly have to go through infertility. Now, I'm 47 now. Yeah. <laughs> I was almost 16. So it's been, it's been a couple of years. It was right, just like right. two years ago. Right. Um, I'm not sure what prompted him to say that, but I'm thankful that he did. I grew, oh, okay. up, I grew up pretty dysfunctional. So I had been molested. Okay. A, couple, a year and a half later, I lost my virginity to date rape. So those were two pretty 
huge difficulty sexually to get past and be right. functioning sexually. But he planted the seed of infertility and possibly adopting. And that came up later when I actually did go through infertility and okay. I did end up adopting kids. Um, I was pregnant also. We, ha- we have actually 18 kids total. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have five that I call extras. They were kids that were in foster care long-term or aged out with us, but were never adopted. And then we have 13 that we call our permanent residents. We have papers on them, legally binding, and we're yeah. strong, responsible. Five of those were adopted. Okay. Now, the other thing, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm throwing out a lot of possible directions that we can take because okay. I was molested growing up and I did right. lose my virginity to date rape. And then I did go through infertility. Um, I ended up being pregnant seven times. Wow. And I lost three of them. Um, Now, the final pregnancy, the seventh pregnancy, I lost twins at 19 weeks and ended Mm. up having a hysterectomy. Yeah. So kind of, I've had a lot of things that impact your sexuality, emotionally and physically. Right. That were tough. I did appreciate that, doctor, though, because he made me feel okay. He made me feel good. Like there was nothing super wrong with me, but he did plant that seed that emotionally later when I went through infertility, it wasn't as, I wasn't as emotionally distraught as I could have been. Cause that's a pretty tough thing to go through. So I'm not sure in what direction you'd like to go. (laughs) Boy, yeah, there is a lot there to choose from. Maybe could you talk a little bit about you becoming sort of choicefully sexual Absolutely. and what, what challenges and issues did you experience? Like, you know, and it might've come from a variety of different places, but what kinds of struggles did you have when you were actually choosing to be sexually intimate with a partner? After the date rate, because I, I think a part of it, because it was my first time and you have this image of the first time that you're going to have sex and how amazing it's going to be and knowing that it was going to be uncomfortable possibly, but I felt like everything had been taken away from me. So I did yeah. what I know a lot of women do. I slept with seven people in rapid succession. Okay. So I was kind of like, screw it. If it got taken from me, yeah. I don't even care anymore. Yeah. At that age, you, you want to be sexual. I mean, mm-hmm. I had a, I had a sex drive. I didn't have really a good direction with it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I had a high sex drive. I had never had an orgasm. So I, part of me was like, what, what is all the fuss about? Cause yeah. nothing, a lot of nothing is happening, but I also knew boys at that age and that like late high school college, they want to have sex. And mm-hmm. so I would go on a date And the boy would be interested and I would say something to the effect of, I just want to let you know, if we sleep together, I'll have no respect for you and I will probably never see you again. And And they'd say what? Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Basically. (laughs) The answer is yes. (laughs) Um, You know, because one, I don't think boys care at that age and I'm not trying to stereotype or place blame. I mean, I was definitely 50% at least of that whole. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I set it up so that I would feel disrespected and it would happen and I would walk away. And I, so I learned, what I learned about myself is that I'm capable of having sex be something physical right. without the necessity of having an emotional attachment. And I think that can be a good thing and it can be a really bad thing. Were you, were you having some gratification? I mean, were you happy in that process? I mean, obviously no. it's not a hundred percent, but were you you know, were you feeling awful at the end of these? Or was it sort of like the, partly it was there an, an enjoyable aspect to this and you were feeling empowered? I felt like I had a lot of control Yeah. over saying yes or saying no, which I okay. liked after it had been taken away from me. Yeah. I also felt like sex felt amazing and I was real curious about it, but not comfortable discussing, especially not with boys that age. Yeah you know, like where's the clitoris and why is it two inches out of the way? And, you know, <laughs> yeah. like you, I, you don't know what you don't know, really. I had yeah. never realized that I could bring myself to orgasm. So I was very sexually naive in a right. world where I was seeming to be sexually advanced. Yes, I didn't feel emotionally bad about myself, but it wasn't really doing anything positive. And I, and I also realized my freshman year of college, like this is not the direction. Okay that I wanted to go. I, I didn't want to take prisoners and 
tally up another notch in my belt for the sake of a man proving that he was going to do exactly what I assumed he was going to do. And then I could never talk to him again. So I had mm. this whole vicious cycle that wasn't healthy. Right. I'm not a person who lacks self-esteem. I'm mm-hmm. confident. I kind of always have been. I, I had no issues like that, surprisingly. And But I went to therapy and I actually saw a massage therapist also who, you know, it's interesting the people that can have the greatest impact. And it may be like, well, that's a little woo-woo, you know. <sighs> I'm I'm from Vermont and she was what we call crunchy granola, like okay. no shaving the armpits, totally right. Birkenstock, shower maybe once a week, that and uh very earthy, you know. And she gave me a massage though, and it was so powerful because I learned the value of non-sexual human touch that yeah. feels really good. Hmm. And I had had sexual touch that felt good but not great because I'm not having an orgasm. So there's right. no finish. And I, but I'm not, I, I didn't grow up having a whole lot of touch that was not non-sexual and healthy and felt good. Yes, yes. And it was like a one hour session where literally I was sobbing. And that's, oh, wow. I mean, the therapy was great and it helped in a lot of ways. Public speaking and college did, working with the homeless population and Planned Parenthood. I mean, I did a lot of stuff like that my freshman year of college. It was very women empowering. And here I was kind of in this weird, vicious cycle. Hmm. So when I had that massage, I think I realized, okay, I want to have positive physical touching like that and add the sexual aspect into it. And wow, Mm -hmm. what a difference that would make. Yeah. So I wasn't the type of person that was uncomfortable discussing sex ever, but I I also, it's kind of like learning the computer, you know, you don't really know what you don't know. Yeah, Yeah. And I had a really good friend. I don't think either one of us was particularly sexually attracted to the other, um, which can happen, you know, and we were really good friends. So I could talk to him as someone of the opposite sex. And he looked at me one day and he said, I know I can give you an orgasm, which was like wow. shocking. I didn't realize that was my missing link, you know? <laughs> okay. And I'm like, okay. He goes, we won't have sex. I won't take any clothes off. I, I just, I know I can do it. And I know that because he had, a, had been in a long-term relationship with a woman who could only have an orgasm orally. Okay. And he's like, I'm certain I can do it. And I was kind of like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you be you, go ahead, have at I, it. I call your bluff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I mean, I don't know really, you know, I'd I'd had minimal experience with oral sex and it was always kind of like, uh, do you need a map? Because I clearly need a map. I don't know what you're doing down there, but it wasn't unpleasant, but it wasn't like, I just didn't feel on point. I I didn't write. But because Mm -hmm. I had not learned the art of self-pleasure, I didn't know how to give direction. Yeah. So uh, my friend, Frank, he did his thing. And I mean, literally, it didn't even take me that long. I had my first <laughs> orgasm. And it was, I mean, I remember just laying there and he sat up with a Cheshire cat yeah. grin, you know, and I was <laughs> like, holy cow, I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. And this he just is like, what the hype is. This, I was <laughs> like, oh my God, I'll have another. And he said, you can't expect a man to figure you out if you haven't done it. Wow. So I just want to help you figure out how to figure it out. And I mean, that was probably one of the single best, just emotional gifts and also physical gifts anybody ever gave to me. And a couple of weeks later I said, Hey, could you do it again? And he was like, yeah, sure. It was like, you know, it's like we're, we're swapping books or something. It was like, so not a big deal and not a sexual. And he did. And I was like, wow. Okay. Like I'm, I, I, I appreciated that he was helping me figure myself out. Yeah. yeah. So I think between the massage and that experience, I realized, you know, touch can be beautiful. Mm -hmm. And whether it's sexual or non-sexual, just kind of feeling that way was huge. And then I stopped, you know, taking prisoners and setting that whole, I just stopped all of that. And I actually didn't have sex for probably about a year. Did you start um, masturbating in that time? Yeah, I yeah. did. Okay. I, I was I wouldn't say I was an expert in that <laughs> area, but I was <laughs> I was giving it the college try. Right. Um 
I was learning me, which is a really hard thing for some women to do. And then I got really good at it. Yeah. So what it, what that taught, I mean, I learned a lot though in that process that just because something was taken from me, it's still a first time with someone new. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't get anything back from my past. So I don't have regrets and I, I don't have any self-esteem issue. It kind of is just, it is what it is. Yeah. It's, It's just my past. We all have something. And I was really pretty okay with it, but then I was more selective about wanting to have someone that I actually liked Yeah, and have just being sexual for the sake of doing it and getting it over with so I could walk away from this person type attitude. That was forever gone. Yeah. You know, that those were really, really good lessons and very powerful and very empowering and, um, you know, the next person that I was with, I, it ended up being the person that I married. Oh, wow. Okay. And was the first time I had orgasms during sex and he had been more experienced and than I was, I mean, I had a, I had a number, you know, all my numbers at, at eight, right. but I had a very little experience. Yeah. Right. Cause those and, are all one time, right? Basically. Almost all of them. Yes. Yeah. Almost all of them. So, I mean, maybe four times with this person or right. what well, it was just, and I wasn't even in the mentality where yeah, I was yeah. like, this is sex and it's great and I'm going to enjoy it. And that was a great thing. So then I was with somebody that had a little more experience and was kind of patient. Mm-hmm. And I started being able to have orgasms during sex. And I, I mean, wow, what a just eye-opening <laughs> experience. To, uh, it was so dramatically different. There was no violence involved. Yeah. There was no force involved. There was no emotional disconnect involved. It was like, wow, you can really like this person and have sex and the sex can be really good and you can have an orgasm. And so, you know, I ended up really fairly unscathed by everything that happened in my past. And I did a lot of the work. I did the therapy. I, right, right. I really listened. When that massage happened, I was tuned into that massage, even though it was a little outside of my woo-woo comfort zone. Yeah. Now you can read me chakra cards and it's all good. <laughs> I don't care. But, you know, I mean, at the time I was like, eh, yeah, I'll do a massage. But. So when you met your, you know, then to be husband mm-hmm. and started to develop a sexual relationship with him, were you able to communicate and, yes, it, you know, immediately become a, an active partner in your pleasure and his, you know? Yes. Okay. I was because I knew at that point that there was an end goal. Yeah. And for me, not just for the man, that there was this end goal and the emotional connection meant that there was a process to the end goal. Yeah. I still think at 47, I love the end goal so much. I probably could be a little more tuned into the journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something, something I tell my clients all the time, right? It's and the that's, journey, not the destination. Uh, yeah. But yeah. the destination is really good. It's oh, like it's getting great. off the plane in Hawaii. Yeah. You know? No, it's great <laughs> to be able to have an orgasm if you want one. Absolutely. But, yeah. but, you know, you don't have to rush and you don't have to stop there either. Right. You know, who knew? Yeah. So it was, it was a very positive experience. And because I was, I was capable and willing to do the work on myself from be, growing up in a house where I was molested and losing my virginity to rape and having an unhealthy cycle through the end of high school and college and admitting that the yeah. part of it that was totally me. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a pretty confident person. Yeah. So I, I'm like, you know what, from now on, if I'm going to be here, I'm going to be present. And I think a lot of us are there, but we're not really present. And I, I had fun. It was fun. Yeah. So interesting. Cause in your story, I'm hearing a, a, you know, a few really fortuitous events, you know, between the doctor and the massage and then your friend, Frank, I think you said was, yep. the, was right. The oral sex guy, which is just really cool. It's like these moments that, you know, they come right, right when you need them. And then you had a receptivity to that, right? You had an ability to sort of turn on a dime and take that and, and really go a different direction. I feel very grateful that I was. Yeah. Because a lot of that could have passed by and I could have shrugged it off and it wouldn't have been that difficult. Right. I, mean, I could have justified it easily. And no, I was in tune because growing up, one thing I knew is that I wanted it to be different. Yeah. So to have a cycle that's not perpetuated, it needs to be nothing, the same experience at all. Right. And so I was very receptive. Yeah. 
I was probably craving to the point of starvation, that massage and the oral sex experience without realizing that that's where my headspace was. But yeah. emotionally, I'm sure I was, you know, screaming that I, I needed this and I didn't know where to go or who to ask. And, and so I was blessed that I had people show up in my life and that I was like, oh, you're the one. This well, and help. that you could say yes, because I'm, you know, I'm thinking of my clients who have had trauma of various type and it, and it you know, it could be decades that they're struggling with this stuff. And, and may, I mean, I don't, nobody's told me a story that their friend offered them oral sex, but <laughs> it, was, it, was, it seems to me it'd be so easy to just say, oh, no. I mean, you know, like to back off of that and not take that opportunity. Uh, yeah, it would have been. I mean, especially because we really weren't attracted to each other. Yeah. So the whole thing seemed kind of surreal. Yeah. And like, why would you do that? And you know, when he was done, though, when it was when it was over, and he said to me, "You can't expect a man to know your body if you don't know it." Yeah. And I was like, "Whew!" It was like getting slapped at the end, you know. Right, but right. He was very right, just because he had had a certain he he had a certain skill set yeah. from his past that he had developed that he and he passed that gift on to me. He didn't have to do that, right? There was he, right. there was nothing in it for him except a lesson for me. Yeah, and I, I'm grateful that I saw that and I recognized it. It was very pivotal, and it yeah. happened within the same. I mean, the massage and the experience with Frank happened within three months. Of oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, they were very, it could have even been within a month. I don't remember yeah. back that far, but, and it was only, it was less than two years from the date rape. Wow. So I was very blessed that yeah. I, I did not want to stay in that headspace and I capitalized on what was put in front of me. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I got married and um, I had no, I had no birth control, no periods, no pregnancies in a year and we were air force. So I automatically got sent to a specialist, Okay, but there wasn't a lot of emotional stress. Like I hear other women talk about with around infertility, infertility. Okay. because of that seed that had been planted when I was 15. Okay. So even though this has been, and I mean, that guy put me on the birth control pill that isn't even made anymore because it's uh, the level that it was, the levels. Yeah. And I was on it for almost five years until yeah. we got married. And he said, just go off it and we'll not worry about it. And then now we wanted to have kids, but I also didn't feel, a tr I was 20. Right. I didn't feel a tremendous amount of rush or stress about doing it right now. And in the military, just under the rules of going to your doctor, if you go a year with no period and no pregnancy and no birth control, you automatically get funneled into the infertility. So I think for a couple reasons, because of how I got funneled in, I mean, it wasn't good that I hadn't had a period or a pregnancy in a year. It's not like yeah. that's not stressful, but I was kind of like, yeah, but I already kind of expected something to be wrong. Okay. So were there in, in your journey with infertility and then the ensuing pregnancies and everything else, what was difficult about that? What did it have any impact on your on your sex life, on you know your intimate relationship? Like, what what were the challenges or struggles you did have, if any? Emotionally, I think there's always a part of a woman, and I and I ended up with the hysterectomy at 33, also. Right. And you feel like less than a woman when your woman parts aren't working. Yeah. Like that, your uterus, your you feel less sexual or less desirable, I guess, because the part of you that's supposed to function and have babies and bring life is broken. Yeah. And so it isn't that I was exempt from that just because I had the expectation that I might go through infertility. It made the blow a little easier, but it still made me feel like, well, there are other women you could do this with that aren't broken. Yeah. And here I am totally broken. And I went through, I had seven surgeries. They were all day surgeries where you get released. You know, they flush your fallopian tubes. They take pieces of the inside of your uterus. They check you for endometriosis. They, there's all of these different things where they're basically trying to rule it out. And so you, you still bleed afterwards. It's painful. It's, you know, I mean, they're not easy to go through. Yeah. I was maxed out on Clomid and Provera. So everything was regulated. I felt like I wasn't myself. So I yeah. felt like you put me in someone else's body and I didn't particularly like their attitude, <laughs> <laughs> but I was still slamming the kitchen cupboard you know, right. for a uh, completely unprovoked. And I knew it. And I would be like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's the matter with me. So, you know, the process makes you feel broken, 
and not as desirable. And it makes you feel like you're not yourself. Hmm. You've you start to get lost in the, this process of not being able to have a child. Yeah. And even though I didn't go into it like desperate to get pregnant because I was 20 and, or it was completely this blow that was unexpected, I, I wasn't exempt from feeling those things. Right. I, right. I absolutely felt those things. And, and what was sex for you in that time frame? Was it, was it a place where you could be your old self and have that confidence and sense of connection? Or did it become, you know, yet one more scientific attempt at making a baby. <laughs> yep. It was every other day. I was taking my basal body temperature every morning. It was, yeah. you know, I mean, th- this was 27 years ago. And so I had to take my temperature. We had to have sex every other day. It become became a job. Yeah. It was a chore. Yeah. And yes, I had orgasms, but neither one of us, I mean, you know, you go through seven months of feeling like you're being forced to have sex on a schedule and there's nothing. And I'm going to lay on my back. And I'm going to prop my butt on pillows. And your whole life is consumed by this trying to get pregnant and not to talk about not being in love with the journey. Yeah. And so it, it wasn't fun. So when I got through those day surgeries and kind of had the conversation, your next step is in vitro. Mm -hmm. You're probably never going to get pregnant on your own. I, I can't figure out what is wrong, but there's definitely something very wrong. And I'm, I'm maxed out on any medic, every medication. I just looked at him and I said, in vitro is not the direction I'm going to take. Hmm. So I want you to wean me off the medication and I'm not going to have kids. For me, I was okay knowing that I couldn't get pregnant and have kids. I, that path was okay for me. In vitro path, I I give it up with the utmost of respect for women who will continue down that path because I absolutely was not willing okay. to go there. I, it was just not was not where I wanted to be ever. There was never a period in time where I've regretted that decision. So he okay. was weaning me off of the medication and he did my blood work and came into the exam room one time and he hugged me and this was a guy he's an infertility specialist a little <laughs> day, not real, like very introverted <laughs> super great guy but he hugged me and he said you're pregnant it's whoa it's not on the schedule that we put you on because you are i'm telling you regimented is an understatement yeah and he said it's not on the schedule that we put you on somehow your body randomly popped off an egg and you got pregnant. He said, this is your miracle from God. And you can expect that you may have a rough pregnancy. You have a high chance of miscarrying and you may not ever get pregnant again. We just don't know. And I did have a very rough pregnancy. Hey, it's Jessa here, just taking a quick break in the show. So glad you're with me today. I want to invite you to be a part of the conversation. I run a free Facebook group called Sex, Intimacy, and Relationships. And I share articles and resources. I foster conversation and community. I'm there to answer questions if you post them. And I broadcast live, delivering information, ideas, inspiration that could help you with your sex life. I'd love to have you join me there. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash community. I did get pregnant six more times. Wow. But, and I had, I, I never, never again did I go to anyone for anything. I got pregnant on my own. Interestingly... Every single pregnancy except one, I had the same due date within 10 days. Weird. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> so you um, ovulate once a year. Once a year. <laughs> Actually, the, the man who ended up, the OBGYN who did my hysterectomy was like, you know, the one that you gave birth to on November 7th, we don't know how that one happened because like, I would be like, what's April 19th? Like, that's your yeah. date every single time. I even adopted a couple of kids with the due date within 10 days of my own due date. So somehow I have this massively scheduled, structured biological clock that can only take babies in, in the month of April and beginning of May. So wow. Very interesting, but yeah, my due date six out of seven times was the middle of April 19th to 29th. 
So give me a little sense of um, over the course of all those years, pregnancies, babies, and then adopting more. Uh, how did you do maintaining that intimate connection with your husband? What have you had to do since, I guess, to, I mean, assuming you've brought it back to where you really want it. <laughs> you, you know, know what? I always really wanted it. And this is interesting. I think, I don't know if I'm completely an anomaly. You could tell me this, but if I'm sick, I want sick. I want to have sex. If I have a headache, I want to have sex. If I'm not sick, I would like to have sex. Okay. Um, <laughs> if it's today, I think sex would be a great idea. Yeah. So I think I have, I, I have always through all of it. If I'm pregnant, I want to have sex. Okay. Um, Two weeks after the baby's born, please let's have sex. Just be gentle. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally, I, I I have the sex drive of probably an eighteen to twenty year old boy. Yeah. You know, always, I always have. It didn't get higher in my thirties or less after my history. I mean, I have been basically. I've had the same exact very high sex drive forever. That's one thing about me that's very consistent. I really enjoy it. I love being an active participant. Um, I like the release because physically, if I'm not feeling well, the sexual release, I think I'm like, whew, my headache feels better. I don't feel sick for a few minutes, you know, like. Okay. So it sounds like by removing, removing that scientific approach to trying to get pregnant, like that made it a chore and a job for a certain amount of time. But once you gave that up, it sounds like, oh, I'm free to just enjoy the sex yes. that I have in this relationship with my husband. Yes. Okay. And I would get pregnant. And when I got pregnant, that was kind of the surprise because after my oldest daughter was born and she's 26 now, I started doing foster care. I mean, mm -hmm. basically I went right into, okay, well, I still would like to, and someone made a difference to me. And I was a kid like these foster kids. I grew up just like they did. Yeah. So in my mind, I thought, well, if my third grade teacher made such a difference to me, I could make a difference to them. So I was 20 years doing different things in, in the foster care arena, adopted five kids, kept five, even though I didn't adopt them. Yeah. <laughs> um, people are like, oh, you took on extras. No, I had extras because I, I would get pregnant and be like, well, we'll see what happens with this one. Right. You know, I had two miscarriages after my first child and then I had a, a delivery and then I, I had three deliveries and then I had my final miscarriage. And so the hysterectomy, I would say, was the only other time that I felt those same infertility feelings less than a woman. Like I have no plumbing. Yeah. They, took right. out, they took out all my plumbing. Okay. So everything that makes me female is gone. And after seven pregnancies and 11 years of breastfeeding, I got a boob job. So those are even fake. <laughs> <laughs> you have them, but they're not, they're not yours. They're fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, definitely that was my gift to myself after going mm -hmm. through 10 surgeries and seven pregnancies and 11 years of breastfeeding. I have no self-esteem issue with my breasts, but <laughs> like they're not a hundred percent real and all my other plumbing is gone. Yeah. So yeah. I, I did really struggle with, I didn't want to get pregnant again. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I was completely, oh, I was very blessed that I was able to have four live deliveries that I actually got pregnant seven times. The, the doctor who did my hysterectomy said, I don't know how you got pregnant and kept any of them. Like you should wow. never have, your infertility specialist was right. It really makes me wonder what they were seeing. I don't know. That I would love to. <laughs> you got pregnant and delivered baby, so it worked. Right. So, <laughs> what in the world were they all looking aghast at? It could. It could be outside of science too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, there was a point where I was like, I think sex causes pregnancy. I don't know. I might be wrong, but I don't think it's infertility doesn't seem to be working for me. But the right. sex thing really is. So, um, I think sometimes it's just bigger than we are, and we don't have the answers, and that's that's okay. Right. Right. But I was really felt blessed. And even though I was 33, so I was young and I had a hysterectomy, I didn't want to be pregnant again. I didn't again, want to have the choice removed. And I think that's, that's probably a consistent personality trait with me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm pissed off if I don't get to make the choice. Well, and you had some early choices taken from you that would set you up, you know, to be especially sensitive to that. It seems to me. Yes, yeah, I did, and I I think I'm I'm pretty good at admitting that that's yes I did, and so that was that was pretty tough. The surgery was really tough. Mm. Um, it ended up being three surgeries, and it was very very hard. I had five blood transfusions. Oh I, my gosh! 
I had internal bleeding. I was dead on the table. There was all, there were all kinds of complications. Now, and I gained 35 pounds. A lot of it was probably water weight. And because I had five blood transfusions and I mean, it was a lot of extenuating circumstance because I, I always gained about 20 ish when I was pregnant. And then I had a hysterectomy. I'm like, you took stuff out and I gained 35. <laughs> That's like a cruel joke. Yeah. But I felt the, the least like myself kind of like back in infertility when I had the hysterectomy and it, well, within nine months, I was on a stage competing in fitness competitions. Let's put it wow. that way. After my hysterectomy, I like to take charge of yeah. myself because no one's, I'm not going to sit around being helpless. And I thought, well, the weight will come off. I can, I can figure that out. And so yeah. I went to a fitness trainer and I was like, I want to buy shirts I can tuck in and a belt because I've been breastfeeding for so many years and pregnant. I want to buy high heels. I want to get back in shape and my personal trainer said, why don't you do a fitness competition? I went, great, sign me up. That way I'm at point A and I need to be point by point B at this time. And I work well in that system. And so let's get this done because I really wanted to take charge of feeling like myself again. And that the hysterectomy, I just like infertility, I did not feel like myself right. anymore. So sexually that was more difficult. That's also the period of time that I got divorced. Uh. So within a year after my hysterectomy, I was divorced. Oh, wow. At that point, I had had four kids and adopted four, and I'd been home for 10 years. And so that was a totally different challenge because I had to get back into the workforce Yes. after being out of it for 10 years and being blessed to be a stay-at-home mom. Um, I now had an ex-husband. I had had this hysterectomy. The hysterectomy was also difficult because like infertility, well... Infertility changed things sort of emotionally, I guess, because you're you're snappier. You're, the medication makes you feel like you're not yourself. Yeah. The hysterectomy made me feel like I was not myself physically because I had been cut from hip to hip. It had been three surgeries. Two of them were internal and one of them was external. Even though I know where the clitoris is now <laughs> and it wasn't touched. Yeah. And it's been 14 years. It was like putting me again into a body that wasn't the same. It didn't, yeah. I didn't work the same. And orgasms are more difficult to have now than they mm -hmm. were before. Now, logically, that doesn't make sense to me. But I just know that in the last 14 years, my body doesn't work the same. Orgasms are harder. They're stronger. Yeah. They're better. Um, they're more difficult to achieve. But... I I also used a vibrator for the first time. You know, I mean, like I got the divorce and I was like, okay, I can't get pregnant anymore. I'm done having kids. I'm starting over. Um, it's weird to start having sex with other people again. Right. Not because I was self-conscious about my body or anything like that. Just because it's, you know, I went through, my body went through a lot with this person. Yeah. And so there's a level of comfortability that you have just in your history. You can be a size four and doing fitness competitions, so you look great, but it's somebody new learning about all the scars that you have. Right. And that was, I mean, just having sex is okay, but the emotional connection for me was now different. I was yeah. kind of older and wiser and, and definitely had scars to show that. And, um, and not in a bad way, just in a, wow, this is a lot different than yes. back before. Yeah. You're not completely sort of unencumbered, you know, like a 20. <laughs> yeah. Physically, right. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. And sex is different when you have kids because they hear you and they listen and you <laughs> have to be quiet and you be quick and you're dating people with kids. Uh, you know, I mean, it was a whole, it was a whole unique set of challenges that I had never had to experience. Before. Right. And here I am. I mean, it was less than a year after a hysterectomy where I, you know, our sex life wasn't happening at that point, that last year or so. Yeah. And so I hadn't really been sexually active after the hysterectomy. And so here I, I have been this person that's like, I know what you can do and how you can do it and where everything's located. And I've got the map and I have my act together and it's all good to be. I, I, literally, I was like, yeah, I work differently and we're going to have to figure this out together. I need a whole I new map. You know? I need a whole new map. Yeah. And your, your baggage is different than yeah. when you're, you know, yeah. in your 20s. And right. I, I, that's not a good or a bad thing. But here I am dating someone my age and I'm older now 
and we both have some scars and some history and some baggage. And so it was a very different emotional relationship to navigate. Right. On top of the fact that I felt like I don't know what my body is doing now anymore. And then I had one partner who I was like, hey, I've never used a vibrator. Why don't we do that? To, hey, why don't we use a vibrator every single time? Because it's faster and easier and I don't have to take time figuring you out. Uh And now, even with years gone by, that is absolutely still how I probably have nine out of 10 of all orgasms with some sort of bullet vibrator involved because it still takes a lot to figure out how to finish. And the journey is much more fun now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the sex is so much better, but the finish line is a little harder to to get to. Right, right, right. And there's just nothing that puts out that much stimulation. like a. Oh my God. No. (laughs) And I think that's probably a big part of it is that, well, I've now desensitized my clitoris and I liked, because when I was in, you know, big time vibrator use mode, I had younger kids. I was very conscious of new relationships and not bringing a man over. And, you know, the person that I was with, we lived in separate houses, almost our entire relationship. So it was kind of like, it was very sexy to sneak over and have sex and leave. (laughs) Um, And then just spend family time, you know, but it, it didn't benefit me in the long run to try to make it quick and easy and not figure myself out right after a time when I probably should have slowed down the most after the hysterectomy. And it was, it was, you know, a seven year relationship. So then coming out of that, you know, I am with probably the most amazing person I have ever met. He, I had nine kids because I kept doing foster care. Right. I, I adopted another one on my own. Um, five of the extras, three of them I took in during that time when I was a single mom. Yeah. Um, so I had like nine kids and five extras. And I meet this guy with four kids whose wife died. So, I mean, I'm like, well, I've done foster care. I've done adoption. I've done infertility. Now I'm going to do a dead wife. This is yeah. great. I, it was the only thing that I hadn't checked off. You know, that came with a new set of challenges with the kids. Mm-hmm. And now we had instantly, I mean, my oldest daughter had just moved out literally the month before he and I met. She was one of the two people that introduced us. And so we had, we moved in together with 12 kids in the house. Wow. And the youngest was four. And had lost her mom when she was little. You know, I mean, so, and here I am like, dude, I love sex with you. It feels better than I ever remember sex feeling, which is great when you have that such a great emotional connection because we've been together for years now. Yeah. yeah. And that connection is just so good. I mean, literally I'm, I'm like this morning, I was like, I can't believe it keeps getting better. I don't know how that's even, my head is going to explode literally, but he and I are still trying to figure out how to get it done without yeah. using the vibrator all the time. Well, I mean, I, I guess maybe in sort of closing thoughts here, I I don't exactly what I think about desensitizing the clitoris because I hear people talk like that. But I also think you went through something that kind of raised the bar for the amount of stimulation you need, right? And that that happens to everybody as we get older anyway, but with the hysterectomy and the you know physical trauma and everything else, you just may need more stimulation to get to the same point than you did before, right? So I don't Absolutely. think there's any shame in relying on a vibrator, you know? I don't either. It's fun. I mean, it's just fun. The yeah. good thing is that when you're with somebody who's supportive and you have that, you have a good relationship emotionally and it takes you through all these different situations and you, you get to this place where it's really great. Why can't it just be really great? Yeah. There's no complaint in that. So. Right, right. So last thought, I know nobody's going to have, um, share all the various challenges. I can't imagine (laughs) that you did like (laughs) have all these various factors at play, but if you had to sum up your advice for people that might struggle with any of the things you've described, you know, what's, what word of wisdom would you have? For anything emotional, whether it's the rape, the molestation, the infertility, all the emotional aspects of it, figure out what you need like self-care, yeah. really, re- really, I stumbled accidentally. I knew what therapy was, but don't stumble accidentally. Frank is not going to be there for you, probably. Yeah, right. Not um, everybody has a Frank. No. 
really, really try to figure out what you need. And you may have to do that by getting massages that you think are a little woo-woo. Yeah. Because if it works, who cares? So self-care, I think, is the biggest thing because emotionally you need to help you. You you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can put it on anyone else. So in every situation in life, I would say, put the oxygen mask on yourself. And sexual health, get past the fact that you're a woman and you need to be shy about it or that, you know, he's a stud and you're a slut, that it does not exist. Be, you need to just be, leave the lights on. That's my (laughs) advice. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advance access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.